Good morning. I thought I'd share with you some thoughts after having just returned from three weeks away camping, where we went to a state forest down on the beach in uh, about four, four and a half hours from Melbourne. And uh, there was no electricity, no mobile phone range, except for a fairly long walk to get to range or a, a drive to get to range. Um, no hot water. Uh, and three weeks away on that trip was absolutely wonderful to, to really uh, help you detach from the world a bit. And coming back, you end up super relaxed. And I've spoken to a few people since I've returned and they, you know, in doing similar sort of trips, experience the same thing where they come back super relaxed, uh, you know, to the point where you can just sit there doing nothing for an extended period of time and not be bored and actually enjoy the, the, that quiet and silence of, of doing very little, but just observing. So in that, uh, the, the reflection of that is that you, you really, you want more of it, but then we have to go back to the world. So there's this reluctance to then going back to our lifestyle where we know we're gonna get caught up in the world and the higher pace, et cetera, et cetera. So firstly, you know, in reflection of the fact that it feels so good, I, it makes me reflect on the fact that that's really what we're built to do. What we understand from research on hunter-gatherer cultures and anthropological research and genetic research is it takes about 40 to 100,000 years for a change in the environment to be assimilated by our bodies. So, that understanding main, means basically that our bodies that we have are, are bodies that are built for the way we lived 40,000 years ago. And we were hunter gatherers. And when you go away camping, it's a bit more than you get a few more luxuries than you have when you, if you were a hunter gatherer, but the pace of life tends to drop and become more like that. They understand from research on current hunter gatherer cultures and some of the hunter gatherer cultures from the past that they probably worked on average about 15 to 25 hours a week, which uh, if you compare that to our working is uh, a lot, lot less. And then the rest of their time was spent in leisure. When you go camping like that, you know, yes, you do work in getting firewood. You do do a bit of work in terms of preparation of meals and preparation of your camp. But most of the time is spent other than that, we're in leisure, and that the, was the great thing. You know, it's not leisure in watching television or playing with your device, it's reading books. We played Scrabble, going to the beach, going for walks, having a nap. It was, it was wonderful. And um, so really, the way you live when you go camping is the pace that we're, we're built for, that we, we need to, you know, that is ideal for us. And then you compare that to, you get home from that and you feel so good and then you look at it and say okay well how does that compare to my normal way of living and we live a much higher pace so the question then is how do i maintain this in my normal day-to-day -day living and unless someone out there knows a secret formula whereby you can deal with the practicals of the world as in paying rent mortgage getting food paying bills looking out the kids and all of that uh, and living that lifestyle or having the money to do that, then certainly let me know. But we, we know we've got to work and we know that the way that the work structure is, it's very difficult to only work 15 to 25 hours a week or 15 to 20 hours a week and, and get by and pay the bills. So how do we then find a way to create that sort of balance and that sort of relaxation in our normal working week? And I think the key is not so much, well, I'm going to maybe take, I know in, I think it was Finland recently or Denmark recently, they introduced a four day working week. And so every weekend was a long weekend and they had massively improved productivity, um, much, much less absenteeism. And even though they were working less hours, they were getting more done than they were previously. So there's some interesting stuff there. We, we can't do that, it's all good in theory, but our culture doesn't have that. So if you can create that great, but the other way to look at it is from a day-to-day -day perspective. How do I find a balance between things that I have to do that I don't necessarily want to do, as in, as in work or chores, and things that I enjoy doing for no reason, which might be reading, it might be yoga, it might be my mum knits, and, and that's her meditation. It might be meditation, it's exercise, it's social time. It's anything you enjoy doing for no reason. And that those, sort of, those things get you out of your head and they create balance. They actually energize you. So boredom is an energy killer, but things you enjoy doing or things you find stimulating or 
engaging even. I enjoy the target words in the paper. The paper. They, they actually can give you energy because they get you out of your head, they connect you with your body, and they create energy. So we look at it from a day-to-day -day perspective, and a lot of people say to me, a lot of clients, when we look at them, when I deal with clients with fatigue, they say, well, I don't have the time, or I can't do this and that that I used to do, or my schedule's full. And we, we look at it and say, okay, well, it might be full in one way, but we have to get creative about finding things we can do day-to-day. -day. So if we're finding that we haven't got the time for it, we have to create the time by extending our tribe, by getting extra help, whatever we can do to create. Sometimes it might be getting up, even though you might feel fatigued. The important thing in understanding, in understanding fatigue is it's actually often not a lack of energy, but it's stuck energy. And when we get caught in lack of variety, when we get caught in boredom, when we get caught in a routine that doesn't inspire us, it robs us of energy. So the important thing is finding things that might inspire us or engage us and stimulate us. If that means getting up half an hour earlier or an hour early to do some exercise, that will actually give you energy unless you've got less sleep. Or if it means finding a way at lunchtime at work to sneak out and spend time in the park and eat in the park, even if you take your friends with you or what have you, finding ways to create variety. After work, often you're when we get home from work, often we can be exhausted, particularly if we've worked pretty hard during the day. In an old lifetime, I worked in an office and I, I worked through lunch so I ate, you know, I ate through you know, while I was on the phone and it was just constant the whole time on the phone and the computer and I get home absolutely exhausted. And that's an example of throughout the day, lack of variety, lack of rest and lack of space. And I'd come home exhausted. If I, on the, on the odd occasion, I did drag myself to, to yoga or to, to some sort of exercise or training. I actually ended up energized afterwards, although it was a real struggle to get there. And that's because I've started to move the energy and free it up. So we look at that as, but you don't want to create that situation where you end up exhausted and then you have to find a way to then free it up. If we can find a way on a day-to-day -day basis to have us time or me time or whatever you want to call it and it's something that we enjoy, then that will actually help energize us and create balance to stop us getting into that nervous system state of the pace being too high. It's worth a, worth a bit of practice, so I'd love to hear people's feedback if they uh, give it a try.